So I've been tasked with talking about the changing nature of uh, phase one trials. You can see the lines of phase, in, phase one, two, and three are really blurred. So in, in some of the slides, we do overlap with uh, Dr. Blumenthal's um, talk, but uh, we'll, we'll try and tease out what really is still within the phase one domain. Here are my financial disclosures. Uh, I work with a lot of companies, so I'm not conflicted in, with anyone. Um, so I think I'm really standing on the shoulder of the giant. I, I really cannot go through every paper that Bruce has written because I will take up my 45 minutes and uh, I can step down after that. So he's really been the, the leader in this field. And as you heard from the last couple of talks, that uh, there's a lot of basis that he has published that we all sort of build upon. And, uh, and I'm grateful to be here to, to speak on this topic that I know is very dear to his heart. So I think we're very familiar with the traditional drug development paradigm, phase one, two, and three, which I think we're still trying to stick with it in some of our clinical trial design, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to actually use this framework, which I think is becoming less and less relevant in the genomics era and the immunotherapeutics era. I think we're dealing with now a paradigm that is more like this, where we are in the early part of the drug development trying to find a proof of mechanism that if we cannot even prove the mechanism of the drug, that we would abandon it very early. Once we're able to at least show that the mechanism is what it is, then we want to quickly jump to a proof of concept. Be that obviously is that we would translate it to a prolongation in patient survival or quality of life with endpoint that is meaningful with a large effect size. And I hope in the last, in the next 30, 40 minutes, we'll talk about how phase one can help shape the future drug development paradigm. So the objective of my talk really is to describe features as a phase one oncologist that I see day to day, what's changing in our phase one clinical trials development in this new era of new oncotherapeutics, and really understanding why these changes are happening and, and really their implications in the drug development process, not just in the technical development of the drug, but also from the clinician point of view in terms of day-to-day -to, -day to our patients to the financial implications. So these are the topics that I would like to cover. The trend in terms of the increase in sample size of phase one trials. We heard a little bit about expansion cohort. I'll talk a lot more about expansion cohort because it seems to now dominate a lot of phase one trials. Uh, that are being conducted for multiple purposes. The enrichment strategy as early as in the phase one setting in terms of selection for histology or for genotype. A little bit of novel uh, dose escalation methods that are being applied. I have to put in a bit about research biopsies. Um, having had many arguments back and forth with my friend Mark Retain on this topic, I have to at least put that in, in a couple of slides. And then really the use of phase one to drive go, no, go decisions based on the ability to provide proof of concept. I think this is probably the take home slide of the deck that I have. Um, why are phase one trials changing? And certainly in, in my 15, 16 years of doing phase one trials, I've seen it really has changed quite a bit to the point that phase one trials are, are becoming increasingly important in the drug development uh, paradigm. I think obviously that the knowledge of molecular biology is increasing and accumulating and the technology is advancing faster than we can really learn from, from uh, publications. This is clearly driving why we want to, to move the field very quickly, starting as early as phase one. We don't need or want to wait for phase three trials to be done. We have drugs and uh, there are molecularly targeted drugs, there are immuno-oncology drugs. They have now become very important part of our oncology therapeutic armamentarium that we actually have weapons to, to um, test in our patients uh, to target and, and combat their cancers. Um, at the same time, despite these ambitious um, points, our patient resources, our infrastructure resources are limited. So with that, we really want to do things efficiently and at the same time still maintain the safety. And hence, I think it is important for us to start thinking about that kind of um, uh, framework as early as in phase one. We heard a little bit about accelerated approval. It is now actually possible when we see compelling results. So again, the incentive to do this as early as possible, uh, at the same time to bring the active drugs to our patients that can improve their, their lifetime and their lifespan and cure cancers. 
these really have fueled all the changes, I think, in the phase one uh, scene. So to cover the increase in the sample size, I think it's clear that when we do a phase one trial here, for the last, I would say, 10, 20 years, we no longer talk about, talk about 30 patient phase one trials. I would say phase one trials are now, by and large, in the high um, double digits, if not in the triple digit domain. Um, it's not surprising that we have protocols where we see the sample size estimated to be two or 300 for a phase one trial. That's unheard of at least 10, 20 years ago to have a 200, 300 pace phase one trial sample size. So that's clearly changing. And this is work from, from here in Boston, from the uh, uh, Harvard group, the Dana-Farber group, showing that you can see from the size of the bubbles that this is truly a phenomenon that is worldwide. So in terms of the day-to-day, -day, what's really happening in the economics and logistics of phase one study, I think we see the overall sample size of phase one trials changing. The number of patients um, are increasing, so by that, the number of centers are typically increased in every phase one trial. The complexity is increased significantly, and I think if you look at each center doing a phase one trial and let's say recruit 100 patients, 100 patients 20, 10 years ago is not equal to 100 patients you put on a phase one trial now. It probably equals 150 or 200 patients because of the amount of work involved to take each patient through a trial. And obviously, the, the cost to conduct phase one trials have also increased substantially. At the same time, because of the selection of these patients and the complexity and the fact that there is a lot more competition to participate in each phase one trial, I would say for individual center, the recruitment per trial is actually decreased. And this is obviously has significant consequences because financially you have to open a lot of number of trials to be economically viable. Otherwise, you open you know, 20 trials and you put on two patients each, that would make 40 patients a year. There's no way you can sustain a moderate to a large size phase one program. There is a lot more regulatory burden in terms of SUSARs, protocol amendments, you heard a little bit about how you can actually have a protocol that has one description at the beginning and at the end when you finish the phase one, it looks nothing like when it first started uh, a couple of years ago. The cost per case for phase one is increasing. There is really a limited experience per site because you only put on a small number of patients to really feel the drug and know the toxicity. And because of that, the need to really communicate with sponsors and with other investigators becomes increasingly more essential. By that, obviously, teleconferences every week or every two weeks, sometimes for an hour or, or even two hours, each conference call, to even share the experience. And that really is to the last point that becomes very essential for this kind of grouping to talk about the data becomes essential for us to actually safely produce the data at the end of phase one to inform how to do future uh, phase, phase trials. And I think these aspects of the changing phases of phase one really have been quite dominant in, in the last decade. So I'm going to touch a little bit on the expansion cohort issue. Um, we and the MD Anderson group collaborated in reviewing um, from 2006 to 2011 over uh, 400 drug trials to see what happens to them in terms of especially the inclusion of expansion cohort and looking into whether you know, their development into phase two and subsequent approval and the influence of the expansion cohort on that process. So just like the size of phase one trial is increasing, obviously we're seeing more and more phase one trials with expansion cohort. And the two phenomena are probably linked, that we're seeing uh, a sample size increase, partly because expansion cohorts being present as a tail in the phase one trials. And when we looked at our um, original um, part of that series uh, in terms of expansion cohort, you can see that the number of phase one trials with expansion cohort, as I said, is increasing. And typically, we see approximately 20 patients in the dose escalation phase and as many patients in the expansion cohort. So the tail is not really a small tail. The tail becomes as big a tail as the dose escalation part. And phase one trials that are typically more likely to have expansion cohorts tend to be multicentric, multiple centers. The use of non-cytotoxic agents, which is obviously becoming more common anyways with targeted agents or immunotherapeutics, and company-sponsored or driven trials. And our exercise was really to understand when 
Papers are published that describe phase one trials, whether the objective of expansion cohort is well stated. And in most of the cases, uh, they are stated, but not well stated. And in many of the cases, they're not stated at all. And you can see the function of expansion cohort varied. There are some to really better understanding the safety of the specific agent. Some are to look at the efficacy, even though it is not supposed to replace a phase two trial. There's a wish to look at early efficacy to see if there is a hint of activity by putting a few more patients at the end of your dose escalation to get a bit better signal. Um, there are some that do want to look at pharmacokinetics in a, in a more um, homogeneous population, especially at the recommended dose. Likewise, for pharmacodynamics, to look at the molecular effect, again, in a more homogeneous group of patients at the recommended dose, or looking at patient enrichment, and somewhat tied to the efficacy question to see whether there are any hints in specific genotypes or histology. And if you look at really at the end of a phase one study with the expansion cohort, the change of your MTD or your recommended dose because of this expansion cohort is about in 13, 10-13%. And new toxicities are defined in about half of those cases that have expansion cohort. When we collaborated subsequently in a part two of that series of MD Anderson, we looked at really whether having an expansion cohort predicts any sort of better outcome for the trials. Granted, that this is clearly confounded because you wouldn't do an expansion cohort if you don't think the drug is going somewhere. So likely you'll tag on an expansion cohort or two or three because you think that you've seen enough in the early part of the trial that the drug has activity and you want to actually study more before you prepare your phase two or phase three trials. So yes, it does ultimately lead to a higher time to approval, but I think this is more of an association necessarily than, than causation. So having a bad drug and doing an expansion cohort does not make it a good drug, clearly. And we even went further to look at the multivariate analysis in terms of time to drug approval and having a large expansion cohort seems to be associated more than any of the other factors to lead to a faster time to drug approval. Again, it is a circular uh, hypothesis because a, a more promising drug that you want to put on more patients at the end of phase one likely means it is an active drug that would ultimately lead to approval, perhaps even in an accelerated approval fashion. I want to touch a little bit on the recent phenomena of a lot of immuno-oncology trials having I call the, the multi-fish hook and multi-fish basket designs, where you have one protocol with literally 20, 30 groups of patients. Um, technically, these are not phase one trials, because most of the time you already have the recommended dose. You're using the same dose across all 20 um, fish baskets, and you're testing different cancers or different um, uh, subgroups of patients. This is extremely commonly used in the IO scene, where I think every company that has an immuno-oncology drug has one or two or three more of these trials to, to really help them signal fine very quickly in terms of the tumor type that they want to ultimately expand. And as we have heard, some of these actually have led to uh, accelerated approval breakthrough indication for a couple of the agents because of a large basket that they have subsequently expanded. So this is just an example of a protocol where you literally have a lot, a lot of groups within the same protocol. And this is the point I was speaking to, really, the complexity for phase one group doing essentially almost like a phase three trial in their, in their um, group, um, where you actually have multiple cohorts opening. And typically, they fall into a phase one program because it's hard to imagine a phase three group for example, taking on such a study when you have so many different tumor types. So despite the fact it is truly not a phase one trial in terms of design or dose finding, it becomes by default a phase one protocol to conduct because this is the most likely um, group of individuals in the hospital that would see a different variety of patients and have the capacity to handle trials that are so complex and, and so vastly changing. And we, we initially had a lot of comments from the IRB saying these protocols are just way too complex. How can we safely actually handle this um, in one protocol and one uh, document? But I think more and more they're starting to find out that we probably have to take that into account that these are the protocols that are current and probably of the future that we just have to educate them and help them um, in terms of guiding them through the review process. 
and um, including the multiple amendments when you have protocols like this, that becomes very, very um, multi multiple and complicated in terms of the process of review and approval in the IRB. I want to touch a little bit on the enrichment strategies um, that will overlap a little bit with the prior talk. I think this is the paradigm that we are used to in many years ago when we do phase one trials. You really want to look at the safety of the drug. Efficacy is important, but really a side question. So there's not as much focus on really choosing the right patients that you want all the way from the get-go. And you can do that later on, either in the later expansion or perhaps even save it to the phase two or phase three part of your paradigm. And, and you know, we would use the dose escalation part to find the safety and the recommended dose very quickly without wasting time. I think we're now more and more used to seeing the design where we are specifically asked to choose very specific tumor types or molecularly enriched patients with specific genotypes. And we would have to, from the get-go, find these patients, which could be tumors that have very rare mutations. For example, um, IDH1 mutations, PEG3CA mutations, or aberrations. And because of that, obviously, to open such a trial, you would have to open at least 20 or 30 phase one centers to actually finish it in record time. There's a lot of concern when companies first have this kind of studies that it would take too much time, and therefore they would open a lot of study centers to expedite accrual. But I think what we have found that because of the fact they open so many cohorts or so many centers, sometimes even each cohort can open very quickly because across the world you will have five or six patients ready to go to fill cohort one or cohort two when it opens. So it becomes a very competitive and, and somewhat difficult environment in the phase one scene because it, it, it is almost uh, as difficult to open a phase one study when you only put on one or two patients throughout the entire study because of that. So this is just an example of a PI3 kinase inhibitor where we are asked to select patients, as you can see, where you have either PI3 kinase mutations or amplifications, loss of P10, EGFR mutation, for example, all into one protocol. And the challenge is obviously not all of these tests on the left-hand side are done locally. Some of them are not provided by our laboratory in the clear certified setting locally that we would have to imagine sending it to the company to test. Some of them we do develop locally, and you do have, therefore, a, a divide of the tissue where you do have some local tests or some central tests, and how do you best prioritize um, if you have multiple trials that the patient is eligible for where you know your tissues will be ultimately exhausted if you do it serially. So I think this, this is really speaking to that. There is an advantage to, obviously, central screening because you can just send them the tissue in the company, they will do it all, give you the results. You do not have to have the infrastructure in place in your own institution, and they will return your information to you, although often there is not a lot of annotation or information to help you guide the understanding of those uh, annotations. Um, local screening has the advantage that you can help actually develop your own infrastructure to do these kinds of local testing. And in fact, to some extent, our molecular profiling program was driven by the fact we needed to find these patients for phase one trials. And we, as a result, used that as an impetus to build up our local infrastructure to do molecular selection. So in that way, it was uh, somewhat advantageous for us to, to be able to do that. The issue, obviously, is the type of local screening, such as the ones I listed on the previous slide, are not typically reimbursed. And many companies that do select these patients for phase one trials do not expect them to pay you for doing these kinds of local screening. You have to find the patients, and you will have to pay for the local screening. And if you do not have a, 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 a local hospital that has a vision that this is important to build, then you are really stuck that you're not able to recruit to these competitive phase one trials. Um, obviously. What happens at the end is many academic centers, such as ourselves or here in Boston, we have set up our local laboratories. We use validated multiplex assay. We get funding, either peer review or foundation or the hospital support to help us uh, fund these kinds of uh, programs. Um, in terms of identifying rare subsets of patients, uh, as I said, 
as you have to find these patients, you have to increase the number of centers that are being involved. And in order to do that, you have to have a very frequent communications because each center really only know a few number of patients. And without the support of uh, either the sponsor or if it's in the case of an investigator initiated study, having the, the drive and the ability to actually pull the investigators together to talk very frequently, you really don't have a good sense of the drug. And the other way when you have very rare molecular subsets of patient is to even open basket trials and umbrella trials like you heard earlier in the phase one domain, again, because you want to be able to translate the results of the molecular profiling into some sort of outcome. And by that, the most, the most useful way is to put them on genotype matching trials. And if you only have one or two of these patients, you want them to be able to put several of them in the same protocol, and hence the development, I think, of these master protocols that allow you to put multiple patients within the same protocol that allow you to actually be more economically viable. So this is really what I think most programs in, in the world are now doing, whether it's a fresh biopsy or archived specimen that we are using this to have the results available, ready in the electronic records to allow us to select patients, whether in the bottom they are opportunistically into different phase one studies, or whether they are design umbrella basket trials that allow you to specifically put these into those trials that are looking for those cohorts of patients. Uh, I think that's really happening across the world. Um, just to give you an idea of the experience of that so far in the last, I would say, three, four years, um, the big institutions, MD Anderson has published experience in JCO looking at their clearinghouse protocol where they have screened over 2,000 patients. And if you really do the math, at the end, about 3% of their patients went into a genotype matching trial. And that amounts to about 54% of, of the patients. When we look at our data in uh, Princess Margaret, again, looking at patients that were um, genotyped using, in this case, it was from a 23 gene panel all the way to a 48 gene panel over the last three years. We have matched approximately 5% of our patients into clinical trials that are genotype matched. So again, very low number. And there are many reasons for that, obviously. And the, the most likely reason is that we do not have a lot of druggable mutations, as you know, um, in, in the current knowledge of genomics medicine. There are probably a lot of patients that have genotype that we do not have a, a good understanding of their molecular finding to know what is the best way to match them. It's not as straightforward as a PI3 kinase inhibitor for a PI3 kinase mutated tumor. Patients can fall out while they're waiting for the results to turn, turn um, around. And uh, there are some screen failures where they, they just do not have sufficient tissue, for example, for us to, to genotype. But regardless, if you look at the experience worldwide for this type of endeavor, it, it's ranging around the low single digit to as high as you can see, it's about 20%. Um, and the 20%, for example, in the Shiva study that was just published, is about 26% by the French group that is deliberately biopsying patients and matching them into very specific um, baskets of uh, drugs. And in that case, it's about a quarter of the patient. So we're, we're way behind in terms of our ability to profile patients and put everyone onto a trial. And if you look at, in our experience, the matched patients, as you can see in the middle, the vast majority are phase one trials. Um, this is in the era when the, the baskets and umbrellas have not yet been opened. For us, in order to translate these outcomes, the best way we could do is we have phase one trials that are looking for these patients. This is where we would match them. So it was very opportunistic, as I would put it. And if you look at the patients that were unmatched, they were typically in, in a more even across the phase one, two, and three um, uh, types. And we did do a comparison, and, and the paper is being um, uh, written right now for submission looking at the comparison between genotype match patients and genotype unmatched patients. And there is a hint that the genotype match patients have a higher response rate and a, a higher percentage of patients with any degree of tumor shrinkage. But obviously, that's a retrospective comparison that has all the caveats. But 
we are all trying to find a, a, a readout that suggests that this type of endeavor is worthwhile. And at least that is our attempt to show that that personalized medicine um, is it's justified. So where are we at in terms of molecular profiling for our patients in the phase one scene at Princess Margaret? Um, we're actually going backwards. We decided we're not going to use our 48 gene panel anymore because when we looked at our experience, the vast majority of patients that we match onto the trial could have been found using a much smaller panel. So we decided for cost reasons, we're actually going to look at a larger number of patients with a smaller panel of genes so that we can hopefully identify more patients using this smaller panel that is more um, economically viable. So when we look at our patients that are matched, as you can see in the bottom, 95% of patients could have been found on a smaller panel of 26 genes, which is the middle part plus the uh, left hand uh, of the Venn diagram, where we're including the 26 genes instead of the right side, which is the, the 48 gene in the bigger panel. And we actually did an exercise when we looked at our, our patients that was on the molecular profiling study, which is our impact compact study, and we had put it all using the smaller panel we would have identified over 90% of patients in most cases with these druggable mutations using the smaller panel. So what we want to do is to actually, as I said, cast a wider net, selecting the patients more carefully on who actually would likely have a druggable mutation, use a smaller panel to test them, and then in addition, we will using this big pool of patients that have been molecularly profiled using a smaller panel, identify hypothesis-driven question to do much deeper dive. So we, we do have a much higher uh, panel, and we have exome sequencing. But like others, we cannot afford to do a higher 500 gene panel on everyone or exome sequencing in everyone. So what we want to do is to be able to, after deciding uh, who to broadly cast a net, select out very specific patients that we would use the deeper profiling to ask m uh, very hypothesis-driven questions in instead of random um, uh, screening. And that's really where our molecular profiling initiative is going in, in Toronto. Uh, I won't cover too much about the umbrella uh, and, uh, and uh, basket since you heard a lot about this. We just recently wrote a review la uh, listing some of the endeavors that are ongoing worldwide. Um, umbrella trials tend not to be run in the phase one program in our experience because they tend to be more disease specific. So lung, for example, lung map. We find that this tends to go more in the disease site group in our institution because they see the patients in especially in earlier first or second line. On the other hand, we tend to do a lot of the basket trials in the phase one um, uh, domain as I mentioned, because they tend to be mixed tumor types, and they are specifically usually looking for aberrations of one or two kind. And it's sort of designed almost for a phase one group to handle, because that's the kind of patients we see in the phase one clinic anyways. So we, we typically open a lot of our basket trials. And we actually have our own uh, local design basket trial to allow us to uh, increase the actionability of our molecular profiling exercise. It's hard to justify to do molecular profiling and have no patients ever treated on a match because essentially you've done all that for, for, for no good reason other than to obviously generate the data and the repository that ultimately you can learn from, but you do want to be able to actually translate to some sort of clinical outcome. I want to touch a little bit on immuno-oncology in the phase one setting. Um, I think just like many others in the phase one domain, immuno-oncology has come like a tsunami that all of a sudden a non-immuno-oncologist became an immuno-oncologist overnight and sort of have to learn how to talk about T-Rex and TILS and uh, PDL one just like our immuno-oncology colleagues. So we have actually noticed quite a significant increase in our repertoire of IO trials in the phase one domain. As you can see in the last couple of years, in our program, which we typically enroll about 200 patients a year, we have a substantial number of patients uh, being enrolled on I.O. trials. We've decided that instead of competing with the I.O. group, that we would work together with the I.O. group so that we can actually leverage each other's experience. And most of the trials that come now are either I.O. alone, I.O. plus combination, targeted, or I.O. I.O., that it makes sense for us to actually work together. So this has helped us actually 
to increase our experience in the, in the phase one domain at, at the Princess Margaret. The complexity that comes with these trials is, as I said, many of them have specific selection for histology or, for example, um, uh, specific uh, features that allow you to actually select out patients in your clinic. And when you have six or seven or eight of these trials open, it becomes very challenging in the clinic to try and remember which patient population you actually have trial spots for and which ones you don't. And going to the community to get in patients for us to enroll in these trials become equally difficult because they said, well, which patients do you want? And we said, we're going to send you a, a, a map like this. They said, well, essentially, you have asked me for every patient that we have because you haven't actually specifically highlighted which patients you do or do not want for your trials. So we try to send newsletter and highlight which patient populations we want. But at the end, we decided perhaps a better way is to go electronic. And we're actually actively dividing an app. I, I've seen the alpha um, format of it. We're, we're hopefully beta testing it uh, in the next few months to actually use this to help us in clinic. And if we can use it locally in clinic, we can then roll out to our community oncologists to help them at least narrow it down to what kind of trials might be available. We're a bit careful because we don't want the patients to come into the clinic saying, we want trial C only. You might not have a spot available. And it would be very difficult to disappoint a patient when you don't have those trials. So that's why we, we need to be careful in terms of how we do this so that it is actually an aid and not a burden in terms of uh, uh, allowing us to find the right patients for these trials and, and allocate them appropriately. But this is going well, and hopefully we can roll it out. And we're willing to share once we figure out all the bugs in, in this particular uh, app. So moving on towards the end, I think I'm going a little bit over. I won't be too much longer. Just a touch on the dose escalation methods. I think, I think most of us are now familiar with going beyond the 3 plus 3 or rule-based design. So we have definitely been seeing a lot more model-based design, whether it is a EWOC or BLRM model-based design that requires uh, the expertise of a biostatistician really hands-on to help us understand how to fit the curve so that you have very little excessive um, overdosing or very little underdosing so that majority of the patients are in the middle zone of ideal dosing. Every time you accumulate data after each cohort of patients going through the dose escalation, there are some sort of hybrid rule-based, model-based, but still adaptive type of design that allow you to get a better confidence around your recommended phase two dose. And I think we're delighted to see that the newer dose escalation methods are actually coming into play in, in the protocols that we're seeing in the phase one clinic. A touch, just briefly touch on tumor biopsies. I think this remains extremely controversial in the phase one scene. Um, I think the important thing I want to point out is there is a difference between doing a tumor biopsy to identify a predictive biomarker to you know, try to match them to a specific target uh, versus doing a tumor biopsy to purely understand the pharmacodynamics. And we're obviously very careful in, in our explanation why a biopsy is done, whether it is done specifically to really understand the pharmacodynamic effects versus it actually allows them to get into the protocol because of a specific hypothesis. But nevertheless, regardless of what it is, patients are, are quite um, keen to go on trials. And they're quite keen to obviously undergo biopsies if it helps them to get into a trial. And you have to be very careful in terms of the therapeutic misconception that you do not overpromise the benefit. But what we have found that is that many patients are willing to go through biopsies. And we specifically did a survey, and we asked about biobanking. And you can see over 90% of patients are willing to share their samples for future research, which is obviously important. And likewise, uh, this paper from the TGen group looked at the various tests in phase one trials in terms of patients' willingness to, to go through the various tests. Tumor biopsy is sort of in the middle. And as you ask for more and more biopsies, the willingness the diminishes uh, in terms of enthusiasm and willingness. So Mark, my friend's argument is that we have really learned very little in terms of PD biomarkers from biopsies that would ultimately impact on phase two and phase three dose or schedule. And this is where I think the pendulum really swings depends on who you talk to. I think most of the, the, 
people in phase one still believe that we need to see what's happening in the tissue to allow us to move to a later phase testing of a drug when you don't see clear clinical shrinkage of tumors. Um, I think, especially in the immuno-oncology era, I think seeing you know, immune infiltrates is really gratifying for us to know if a drug is actually going to likely bring in the, the T cells to help fight the cancer. So I think this part will remain somewhat controversial in the phase one scene. And this is really my last slide, and Dr. Blumenthal already um, um, covered a lot in terms of really we are now able to use phase one to allow us to accelerate approval of some drugs, not every drug, unfortunately, but some drugs. And these examples really stand out because to have a time to approval from phase one in three to four years really is unheard of compared to the past eight to 15 years time frame. So I think this is the future vision I have, that phase one, phase two, phase three will be blurred. We basically are going to do smart trials. We can immediately select out after preclinical testing the right histology and molecular subtype, understand quickly through a very you know, nimble trial the pharmacology, toxicity, and then right immediately move into proof of concept where we find substantial benefit. And what I think we have nowhere covered at this point is really the whole question of dynamic and change. And I think Dr. Haber's point this, this morning was very enlightening, how we can incorporate some of these kind of circulating tumor cells or other strategies to help us dynamically follow tumors to understand the evolution and heterogeneity that actually we can move along with the tumor or even preempt that as early as in the phase one setting. But I think that part is at this point really not touched at all and I think we still have a, lear a lot to learn in that regard. So I will skip my comments as well but I just do want to put a, a pitch in that I think it's very important that we educate our, our study team, our patients, IRB members, et cetera, when we come to phase one, because things are really changing so fast that if we just take it for granted that this is happening and everybody should know it's happening, it, it's much more difficult to run a phase one program. We find it much easier that now we have engaged IRB, explain to them frequently what is happening. We have periodic visits to the IRB to actually tell them you know, what the changing scenes are in phase one to make actually all of our lives much easier to get protocols approved. I want to thank my Phase 1 team in the hospital, and thank you for your attention. I'm looking at two giants, the original giant and now the latter-day giant. Uh, Lillian, this is a, perhaps a self-serving question dealing with Project Datasphere, as you know, that uh, entity of the CEO roundtable that's a data uh, acquisition, transparency, aggregation, making clinical trial data in all phases available for everybody for research. One of the challenges that arises is in the de-identification. The anonymization of individual patient data is really a challenge when you begin to accept genomics or omics in general. So uh, of all the solutions, perhaps the best one is at the, that the enrollment of a patient to ask the patient, would you be willing to give and allow all of your data, including omics, uh, in such a research environment? Could you just address a little bit of patient selection and then that interface? Yeah, in our molecular profiling study, we actually about a year and a half ago put in a blurb specifically for data sharing for that purpose because we actually explicitly put it in there. And from our experience, I don't recall a single, maybe one or two patients that would check the box to say they would not. For the point that we want to be transparent, instead of imply, we actually put it there. And for patients to actually say they're willing to data share for that reason. The challenge, what I find sometimes is, if they're in a phase one study on a drug that is not published, the company may not be willing for you to put that into the data because, or, or to be shared. And I don't know, I have solution to that barrier. <laughs> 